Good afternoon, everyone. I am Takiwa Smith, founder and exec director of Science Engineering Mathematics Link Incorporated. I want to welcome you to our first program activity of our 2021 program year, our STEM in the City workshop. STEM in the City workshop series is a program of our math and science career academies whose purpose is to provide opportunities for you to learn more about earth and environmental scientists careers by meeting and interacting with earth and environmental scientists and learning more about what they do in the field in their offices and using technology so today we have the pleasure of having our first in the city speaker for this year dr lisa white so dr lisa white <laughs> is the Director of Education and Outreach at the Museum of Paleontology at the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to coming to UC Berkeley in 2012, Dr. White was Professor of Geosciences at San Francisco State University for 22 years. Dr. White has extensive experience with science outreach programs for urban students, and she is active in efforts to increase diversity in the geosciences a micropaleontologist, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> by training and, fellow, and a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences and the Geological Sciences Society, excuse me, of America, Dr. White guides students in oceanographic, you can tell I'm not a, <laughs> a earth environmental scientist, <laughs> let me slow that down, oceanographic, Dr. White will correct me, and marine geoscience learning experience when actual field work is possible. As the education director of the Museum of Paleontology, she develops online learning materials in paleontology and earth science. Dr. White holds degrees from San Francisco State University, a BA in geology, and the University of California at Santa Cruz, PhD in Earth Sciences. So welcome, Dr. White, and I'm gonna turn it over to you to lead us in our virtual field experience. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for making time to do this. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you so much for that introduction. So I'm gonna get ready to share my screen and I'll talk a little bit about my background. And as, uh, as uh, Ms. Takiwa said, I have a lot of different kinds of specialties. So I am a paleontologist by training, meaning that I do study fossils. So we're going to explore some fossils together. But some of the work I do extends to other disciplines of our science. So that includes oceanography and marine science. And the thing I enjoy so much about the work I do at the museum uh, and with fossils is a lot of what we try to do with this project that I'll share, and these particular fossils, is we want to determine what the ocean was like in the past. So millions of years ago, what did the seas look like? And the project and the images and the learning materials I'll share, they're part of this program we call EPIC, so Eastern Pacific Invertebrate Communities of the Cenozoic. So you don't have to worry so much about that whole title, but uh, if you want to explore these resources on your own after I'm done, then you can Google uh, Epic Virtual, you know, Epic with two C's Virtual, or just uh, Epic at Berkeley, and so and so you'll find these. But it's fitting that we start with just what is a fossil anyway? So I get and um, I'm, you know, I'm always amused at the kinds of questions that I receive when I tell people I'm a paleontologist and I study fossils. So many times they think, oh, you must study dinosaurs. And that is one type of fossil. I love dinosaurs, but I happen to specialize in the smaller fossils. So ones that you need a microscope to see or that you know, thousands of them could fit in your hand like we see here. But, but I want to be sure as we explore what fossils are, as I bring you these opportunities to just explore some of these great field areas in California virtually, that we really think about what 
we study uh, when we examine the remains of past life. So here's me in the field. You know, we, we dress casually. We have tools. These are rock hammers here. And I just collected a fossil at this site that's here at this level of, of the rock. And so we often ask ourselves and we pose questions when we teach about fossils. You know, what if you found something that reminds you of, of something that you've seen living? And so in this case, uh, this uh, structure we see here, it's part of a sand dollar. So just like we find sand dollars on the beach today, uh, in the past, they lived in areas that were underwater. And so now when we go to sections of rock and we see, you know, this kind of shell in the rock, then we must realize that this area was underwater in the past. So part of this whole starting point of understanding what fossils are, what they represent, uh, and where we find them today means that we usually are learning more about other fields too. So it's helpful if you know something about the biology of organisms, uh, fossils are buried in rocks. So we know something about the, the brown material that you see there, it's a kind of sandy material. It's, it's, it's like beach sand in a way. Uh, but here are these fossils again, this is just, this is a quarter for scale. So we just keep asking ourselves here, well, what are some features here? And sometimes when fossils are buried, uh, they get covered with a lot of sand and other material. And so sometimes we can't see all the features that we would normally see, say in a sand dollar, because you know this has been buried for some time. But, but we mostly keep asking, you know, how can we figure out what this is? You know, even if we can't see all the features, how do we solve this mystery of, of what kind of fossil this is? So the text that's here just explains why we even took this project on. So why we're excited as a museum of paleontology to share these virtual experiences and the opportunity to really focus on what kind of evidence we gather when we go to these field trip places to understand what we see there. Um, what kinds of fossils do we find? What kinds of ancient organisms are represented here? And so when we look in more detail, we can see with this particular fossil, we're starting to see more structure. We can see some little plates here. We can see uh, these kind of little segmented uh, areas that form this pattern that radiates out. So we just keep asking questions. We're often working with teams of people to help guide us in what it is that we're seeing. And so here we're, you know, understanding that fossils are the remains of past life, but how are we gonna figure out what this fossil is? Does it remind us of anything else that we know that uh, lives now that could be related to this? So we usually, when we're in the field, you know, we're making observations, we're collecting, we're making sketches, but we also wanted to be sure in this exercise, as we introduce you to fossils, that we distinguish, you know, what is a fossil and what isn't, and how do we know? Because sometimes we just see things like this that look like they have interesting shapes, but how do we really know if it's a fossil? And because fossils are preserved in rocks, like we see over here on the left, where we're looking at an up-close picture of sand, we make all these different kinds of distinctions about the actual remains of past life that's in the form of either a shell or a bone, or even um, leaves and plants can be fossilized, uh, or, you know, it just, it might be a rock. So, so let's go back to our fossils from the area we were discussing before and see, okay, well, this looks like another one of those circular sand dollars. You know, this looks like it might be something else, but it sure has these kinds of folds and ridges. You know, sometimes when we're looking 
at rocks that you might have pieces of other things that maybe aren't as well defined, but we all, we take all of this into account and it's part of our data gathering and the information that we collect. So we'll just keep looking here as we go through this introduction to fossils and realize that sometimes we find things like this. So in this photo, I'm holding what is mostly a uh, group of sand grains. So all these little blue colors that you see here, and then there's some light ones, uh, are a kind of sand, a kind of beach sand again. But in this case, I don't see any shells of fossils, so I don't see anything that looks like it is the remains of a shell or a bone or anything like that. And even if we take a close look, you know, with the photo over here on the left, it looks like blue and gray and white grains. So sometimes when you're out in the field, you know, not everything you're seeing is a fossil. And so we need to distinguish between that, between what is and what isn't. But once your eyes are, are, are trained, you know, and used to looking or um, if you're able to anticipate, you know, what a fossil may look like, then this is just a, a classic kind of shell. It's a, it's a clam shell. We're looking at it from the side and the, you know, and the two valves would come together in a plane that we call symmetry. So, you know, one valve mirror images the other. So that can be important when we're trying to distinguish between some different types of clams. You know, they might have different patterns of symmetry. They might look, all look a little bit different, you know, but we know they're all clams. And then sometimes if we're, again, just gathering information about the ancient life that we see, you know, sometimes we don't see a shell at all. We might see an impression of a fossil uh, or we might see a pattern that looks uh, completely different. So this particular fossil, by the way, it's called a trilobite. So uh, it's an ancient, sort of like, you know, a, a cockroach of its day, but it lived in the ocean. So it's sort of like a, a marine pill bug or something that had you know, all these different segments to it. Here's its head up here. It had eyes there and there. So there's so much variety to life in the past that it's amazing, you know, what, what is there. So back to these sand dollars, we have a lot of them. So this is a photograph uh, from our U museum, uh, UC, University of California Museum of Paleontology. So typically what we'll do is after we've been in the field and we've examined uh, some of these fossils, then we're trying to characterize them. You know, the symmetry, we wanna know uh, if there is a repetitive pattern to the shell. And in this case, the sand dollar has these five rayed um, patterns that we see on the front. So, you know, we might call that a, a radial symmetry. And then we might see other shells that, so this looks like something that we also saw in that first field area where it has these folded ridges and everything. So we could measure that and think about what that means and uh, try to, again, just better understand, you know, what these patterns uh, of the organism are like, how they're distinctive from one or the other and then what that tells us you know about past life and then there are organisms like this that have their own kind of pattern too so this is a a coral animal so corals build up reefs so you hear or see pictures of coral reefs in the tropical areas in the caribbean or in hawaii and when this fossil was the living animal there would have been uh, little small tentacles and other kinds of soft parts that would have lived in each of these little holes here or each of these cavities, I should say. So we're always thinking about as paleontologists what the living animal it may have looked like, you know, in addition to what the patterns are or what the characteristics are of the fossil that we do see. Um, and so we always want to be recording, writing down, 
describing, um, even making some initial interpretations of what it is that we see and what kind of fossil it is um, based on what we're observing and also what we know about um, animals of the past. So we do a lot of comparing and contrasting when we're paleontologists. So, you know, we find fossils of organisms in the field. You know, we look at their shells, we make um, descriptions, we'll photograph, we'll make drawings. And then when we get back to our museum, uh, we want to make a fuller interpretation of what we see. But we have to deal with the rocks that we're in. You know, we're saying here, oh, there's actually sandstone that's partly covering the shell because the shell was buried in, in sand. And so we need to just try to account for all of that. Uh, and sometimes we don't even have the complete shell. You know, in this case, it's been broken off. So we're still able to identify the shell because we know enough about the organism because we've studied likely before we even came to the field, uh, we've studied something about um, these shells. And so now we have to try to interpret, you know, it did it, how did it break? You know, was it broken before it was buried? Was it broken because of, you know, the material that landed on top of it? So we do all sorts of interpretations when we see and try to understand, you know, the shells that it, the shells that we do see. And this is another shell in a rock, and so it's broken also, you know, and part of the edge of it is missing, but we're likely still able to identify it. Uh, and in the particular activities and exercises that we have, you know, we challenge you and our users to just try to interpret and see what it is you have. Because you can walk by this and say, I don't, it doesn't look like much to me, right? You can hardly tell it's a shell, but what you're looking at uh, are the outlines of a clam here. And so it, it takes just some looking, some training, you know, collecting that evidence. So making really good observations, comparing what we see maybe to um, other places that we know of, and then um, we keep going. And I mentioned the, all of the kind of comparing and contrasting that we do when we're paleontologists. So this is the fossil um, coral, and it resembles some of the modern uh, corals that we see in reefs. And so, you know, we know a lot of it that way with trilobite. So they're um, similar as I said, to either cockroaches or pill bugs, but they live deep in the ocean. But here's a, one way, you know, we would compare them and find out what's similar and what's different. And in the area that we're studying where there's lots of clams, uh, this is uh, what we call a scallop shell today. People that eat shellfish, you know, eat the scallop uh, shellfish. And so this kind of understanding of what the fossils are, comparing them with living organisms and trying to better understand guides us to some information. And this particular clam or scallop, you know, it's, it's 2 million years old and it looks very much like something, you know, we could dredge or pick up out of the ocean today. So that kind of constant comparison where we're just trying to understand what it is that we see is really helpful when we're trying to interpret past life. Now, I know I've been talking a lot about shells of animals, you know, fossils like clams and their relatives that don't have any backbones. They're uh, what we call invertebrates that have a shell, but there are plenty of other kinds of organisms that we find in the fossil record. And so in this case, this is a plant. So it's a beautifully preserved plant from Colorado and it's 30 million years old. And look how well the leaf is preserved. So this lighter color with the speckles that you see in the background, that's the rock that it's in. So fossils are buried in rocks. And in this case, this leaf was buried, but it was preserved in such a way, you know, we can see the stems, 
we can see, you know, just part of the root of the leaf or plant. And so, yeah, very, very beautifully preserved. So that's just another type of fossil. And in this case, it's a plant. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that when I share with people that I study fossils, they often assume I study dinosaurs or fossils with backbones. So dinosaurs and other reptiles and mammals are great examples of that. And this is a dinosaur uh, relative. It's from an area of New Mexico and it's 250 million years old. So you see its skull here, uh, you see its backbone here, you see one of the limbs there. Uh, so there are these weird early reptile dinosaur relatives that we find uh, in areas that are really fascinating. Now, also on the subject of dinosaurs is we, in addition to the large bones of them that we find, sometimes the fossils that we find of dinosaurs are what we call trace fossils or trackways. So the dark shapes that you see um, in this photograph are the footprints of a large dinosaur that lived uh, millions of years ago. So it's what we call a, a trackway. So it was a, it's a three-toed dinosaur and it left its track here in the sandstone in Arizona 200 million years ago. So we get just as excited about the trackways or the footprints of dinosaurs as we do with the bones. Because if anything, the trackways or the footprints can really teach you uh, much about how this animal moved. You know, we can say something about the speed of the dinosaur um, or its particular posture if we do detailed measurements of the distance between the footprints and if we know something about the height of this particular dinosaur. So it gets really exciting when you can put all this information together, whether you study animals without backbones or animals with backbones, we need to constantly do the kind of observation and interpretation of what we find. And back to the invertebrate fossils for a minute, the ones um, with shells, we do careful measurements and you know we'll want to know the size and the overall shape. And so in this case, this bivalver clam um, that's 11,000 years old, has some particular features. And this sand dollar, I know we talked about sand dollars before. Um, so this one's 2 million years old and has those features. And uh, this is the, a coral. And so um, 30 million years old for this, and you can get a sense of, of its size. So we do a lot of classifying, describing, interpretation. This is a snail, or we call it a gastropod. So it's a um, fossil that's about 10,000 years old from an area of Mexico. And then back to this trilobite again, it's almost 500 million years old. So 485 million years old. So as we interpret these kinds of fossils, you know, we'll often use this kind of shading and colors just to show the different parts of what's kind of an ancient pill bug here that lived in marine water. So we make a distinction between the axis of the shell and then the edges of the shell. So we can get you know, very detailed and technical in our descriptions. And in this guide, uh, you'll find other links to other field guides. And you know, we just encourage people that are very curious about fossils to use these kinds of resources. So what I'll do in uh, the next part of the presentation is I wanna take you to an area of California that is about 200 uh, miles south of San Francisco. So I'm at home in San Francisco now. And several years ago when we started this project, uh, we went to the Kettleman Hills. It's near the city of Fresno in California. So about 200 miles south. And it's in a part of our state that we call the Central Valley. So it's mostly flat there, but there's an unusual structure in this valley that is this series of mountains that are color coded here in green. 
And it's been an important area to, for study because it has oil. And uh, oil ultimately does come from the remains of fossils and other life. So it's all that organic material that gets buried in rocks. And then over time with heat and pressure, it can transform to oil. So when we study these areas, we use maps to help us understand what the geology is. And so geology, broadly speaking, is the study of the earth. It can include paleontology, the study of past life, but it can also include studying these rocks further. So what we're going to do as we explore more of these virtual field experiences, um, let's, uh, let's actually explore the fossils a little bit more and then we'll do some background uh, on the geology as well and we'll just try to put put this all together and one of the ways that we can view this area is through a google map and so the last image that i showed you that had those colored kind of rings is a map that shows through that kind of color coding what we see but now we're looking at this area of central california from the air. So this is a Google map. And so the green squares that you see over here, that's the farmland um, in this part of our state. And then here are the mountainous areas that have the fossils. And then there's another little valley in here and then another mountainous region. But I'll be taking you to areas here that will allow us to, again, just explore, you know, what it is that we're seeing in these areas. And one thing that's uh, pretty striking when you go out to these areas is it can be really dry. So the year that we were doing this work, it was almost summer, you know, it was late spring. And it was a year that was particularly dry in California. You know, unfortunately, we've had some drought years. And so there's just not much in the way of, of green here. You know, it's very, very dry grass or a couple little areas here. But, you know, the reason we go is we're interested in the fossils here and in knowing uh, more about this particular area. So back to some of these invertebrate shells that, again, they're so abundant in these rock areas that they just really you know, jump out at you as you look um, in the rocks there. And so we're just going to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at some features and we're going to try to just understand, you know, what it is that we know about the kinds of organisms that live here and how they're all related. And so here's just an image of a sample of just some of the different kinds of organisms that we find all together. Because usually with these formations, so these rock areas where we go, you find a variety of different kinds of fossils, different sizes. You know, these are sand dollars. There's some big ones. Clearly there's some small ones here. But we love to just take people in the field and explore these areas so we can know more about the ancient history here. And in all the years I was a professor, at San Francisco State University, I would take my classes to this area as part of their project for that particular paleontology class. And so here's a group of students from one of the years that we all went out. Uh, and here are some of the things that are helpful when we go out to these areas is just knowing the age of the rocks. So this is in millions of years. So this, the fossils that I'm going to be showing you are 5 million years old. So back 5 million years ago, uh, this area would have been very much different than what we find today. And all these different names are just the categories of uh, time and also the names of what we call the formations, these units that, that help us understand the fossils. So there's a lot of different science behind what it is that we see. And even I have to laugh sometimes when I think about, you know, why we go in the field and why even explore this, because this doesn't look very inviting, right? It looks hot and dry, which it is. And so you might wonder, it's like, why do we spend all our time here, 
you know, there's fossils in museums. Why not just go see them there? And we do, you know, we go and, and see them there. But those collections start with, you know, going out to the field areas and being able to observe and collect and try to interpret, you know, what it is that you see. And so in this virtual experience, there's a lot of text and explanation on the left side, um, but that's just our way of um, sharing, you know, what it is that you see there. And so you can go to uh, images like this. So the colleagues that I was working with uh, take a lot of really high resolution images and from far away, it didn't look like there was much at this outcrop, but if we look closely, there's actually this whole bed here of shells oops, that um, is in the center there. So there's a lot of different ways that we try to represent and show what it is that we see, but sometimes it involves looking uh, really closely at a particular area. So we'll go back to our site and we'll just keep looking here. So there's another up close view and here's a quarter for scale. A lot of times we'll put um, a, an, an image, something of a known size next to what we're studying. So we have a sense of scale. But one of the reasons we took this photograph is it shows you one shell, which is a kind of clam, but then it's got another shell on top of it. So many times in um, the past, and you'd expect this with a group of animals that are all living in a seaway together, that they probably were living on top of one another. And so we just try to capture all that and um, give a sense for what might be happening here. And in the case of this area, again, if we're looking back initially at this, what we call an outcrop, you might not see much, but if you look more closely, there's a whole bunch of clams here that are all stacked on top of one another. And so we all, as geologists and paleontologists, just try to imagine you know, what it was like all those millions of years ago and what was happening in California at this at that time to produce, you know, all these clams and other shells in this area. So what you were seeing basically are a lot of these kinds of, of shells. So that kind of approach, just the constant, you know, asking of questions and also just trying to understand what it is that we're seeing, you know, is helpful when we are trying to interpret this whole area that's now bone dry, you know, you hardly see any trees. It's in the middle of our state, yet it has all these fossils that lived in areas that were underwater. So that's just one of the first parts of the interpretation that becomes part of this work is how were these areas um, covered with water um, all those years ago, and they're dry now. So we're going to look at another area here where we can zoom in. And so, again, sometimes when you're in these areas and you're looking from a distance, it might not look like there's much. But here's our quarter for scale right in there. So let me zoom in. And, yeah, maybe it doesn't look like much initially. But then we start looking. It's like, oh, there's a shell over there, you know, we didn't see before. There's actually some shells down here. If we go over here, oh, there are those sand dollars. They seem to be everywhere. Oh, and look, there's like a whole bunch of sand dollars over here. And so this kind of constant uh, interpretation and looking around, there's our quarter again, um, that allows us to get a fuller picture. And so many times, and what we ask our users to do that are exploring these resources are to really consider, you know, what all you might see in the outcrop, you know, zoom, zoom in, zoom out, look to see what else might be here, because it's amazing what you end up finding. And so in this part of the exercise, we ask our users just to do that, you know, to, to zoom in, you know, our coin for scale is right here again. That's that same outcrop. 
So I've outlined in a few of these, you know, where all of the fossils are, and there's some more here in the shadows. So, you know, collecting information in whatever form it's in is just fundamental to what we do um, as earth scientists. And so we just make observations, collect data. We might make some initial hypotheses, but it often takes a later conference and additional comparison. And so I'm just on the left there holding the, some of these are some of the shells that are directly from this outcrop here. And so we're looking at them up close and, you know, sometimes with these shells, some of the shell form, so this white, these white parts here may no longer be preserved, but we still know from the overall shape and other characteristics that that's that same form of life, which is very similar to this one, but in the other one, you know, it's, it's lost its shell. Uh, and so we still, even if information is missing, you know, it can be important. And we also do an overall assessment of the kinds of rocks in the area. So these are kind of a bluish color, you know, the other were brown and you might not think that makes much of a difference, but, but it does. And, you know, we're very interested in the basic kinds of characteristics of the rocks. Um, the, in this case, you know, we've got some pebbles here. We have finer grains up here. And in this picture here, which I showed in an earlier part of the activity, um, we can see there are these distinctive kinds of, of blue grain. So all of this ends up being part of the information that contributes to our understanding. Um, in this case, we've got a lot of these snail shells. So those are um, very different and interesting. And here's some more. And I'm still, you know, just always amazed at how um, well preserved some of these are and uh, what they tell us about uh, the, the life of the past. And so, um, you know, for five million year old fossils, they really um, preserve well. And so I'll just keep running through this and show you some other kinds of fossils here. Uh, and we'll get to some interpretations. And then I wanna show you another area along the coast that we're also working in, in California. And so this is our, from some of our museum specimens. And so you can see that um, they're all different, but they all tell us that this area was under the sea millions of years ago. And a lot of times we have fun to where we will, oops, we need that. Well, where we'll challenge ourselves to try to understand, you know, what the sand dollars that we find in all these dry rocks, you know, what might that environment have looked like all those years ago? And so that was just a fun look at an area um, in modern Monterey Bay where we know um, we find those kinds of fossils. And this video here, so we also ask ourselves, it's like, hmm, where do we find today certain kinds of clams and especially those ones that we call scallops with the ridges. And so this is an area um, on this, a sandy bank, so in the ocean, where all of a sudden, you know, out of the water comes this clam. So, ooh. See, when it moves around like that, they have such an interesting way of moving around. But see, that's that same shape. So all of those fossils that we find in these, this area of central California that is, again, bone dry now, but the fossils look just like that. So that's our biggest clue that this area must have been underwater because this sure looks like that. And we know that these kinds of clams, you know, only live in marine waters. So that's the kind of information we put together to really help us understand uh, the interpretation of the fossils and the environments of past life. And then once again, we find that some of the animals and the shells, so this shell could serve as the solid surface 
for another kind of animal that attaches on top of it, which is a, a barnacle. So we just keep putting all this information together. We acknowledge that sometimes we have smaller specimens of the clams, of these scallops. We also look again at where in the rock section we are because it's a big area, you know, this mountainous area that uh, I shared, I've been sharing pictures of you with, but sometimes when we get to certain levels of the rock, all of a sudden the shells get super small. So to us, super small means, so this is centimeter here and um, one centimeter is about half an inch. And so we went from the size of clams that could fit in the palm of your hand to one that might, you know, just be the size of, of your fingernail. And so this kind of constant analysis of shells, and in some cases, ones that are super small, it's like, hmm, well, what does that mean? If over time we went from these big clams and big sand dollars to these small shells, and some of the small shells even show a sign of what we call predation or um, another animal probably drilled into the shell to, you know, looking for food. And there's oysters there, there's all kinds of good stuff. So we find that by the time we get to the top of these rocks, we find some just really interesting looking changes in the rocks themselves. You know, we have these purpley brown, yellow colors, and again, just really, really odd changes that to us look quite a bit different. And again, really small, you know, more like microfossils, the kinds of you know, fossils that I tend to study, which are even smaller than this, but this gives you just a sense. So what does this all mean? So what we often are trying to do when we study fossils, when we go in the field and we make observations, when we take all those notes and collect evidence, uh, when we compare them with living animals, we come up with these kinds of interpretations where that whole area of the central part of California that now has little water looked something like this. So four million years ago, we would have had the sea uh, totally covering this area. And we have animals like the scallops, showed you plenty of photos of those, snails, there are kinds of mussels, clams, barnacles. We even have crabs there. Look at where our sand dollar is. So we know that uh, given this area, so where I am in San Francisco is more to the north, so a little bit off the map, but this inland sea here, there's Fresno, there's where Yosemite National Park would be here. But millions of years ago, there was this big inland sea that would have stretched, you know, almost all the way to the Sierra Nevada. And so the area where we collected these fossils, Colinga, would have been, been underwater. So that was 4 million years ago. But we know that through time, if we go 1 million years ago, then we see the shrinking of this inland sea and um, the more emergence of land, you know, which is the green areas. And so this kind of approach, you know, collecting evidence, just observing the fossils, putting it together with uh, modern animals is really fundamental to, to what we do in, in paleontology. And so now what I want to do, oh, and there's the team of people I work with. And so typically when paleontologists and geologists, when we do our work, uh, we're working with teams to uh, collect data, capture photographs, and do our work together. So there we are there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to um, a different part of the state. And so I'm going to click over and show you, this is from uh, what we call the Central uh, California coast. And so um, here we also have an opportunity to explore sediments and landscapes and fossils. Um, but now we're at the beach. So we're at a modern day beach, but we're also going to look at rocks that have fossils in them that probably represent an ancient beach. 
So this is an area about a half an hour from where I am in San Francisco. So it's a modern day beach. You can see we have some rocks here in the, um, in the water. We've got our beach here. There's some houses there. And so as we scroll through, you know, we really challenge our viewers with this particular exercise to just think about, you know, if you're at a modern beach, you see shells, you would expect to see seashells along the beach. You know, here's the water coming up on the beach. And so there are a lot of things that you can observe modern day that may be useful to us when we look at past rocks too. And this is another beach area. So it's uh, a little further from San Francisco, but it also has a lot of interesting features. And so along this beach, we've got kind of a flat area here. You know, we've got our cliffs in the background, but there are definitely some differences between the two beaches. So, you know, we are always wanting to, you know, make observations. So we set this up with, you know, let's just have a closer look. So yes, geologists and paleontologists, we spend a lot of time like looking down at the rocks or up in, in the cliffs, but you just never know, you know, what you're gonna find in these areas. So we try to just have a lot of fun, you know, with, with what we see and, and what we do. And so here are some more, you know, these really interesting kinds of fossil shells. So we do our measurements. We just try to figure out what it is that we see. You know, with this particular beach area, uh, we had a team that included a photographer, a videographer. Um, we have my um, uh, partner, my collaborator in this work. You know, we were measuring this cliff. And so, you know, we're all, we're all busy at the beach here. So if we keep looking, you know, we try to, again, put this together with some fossils that we already have in the museum, because over all the decades of research in this area, you know, we've been collecting information and trying to understand, you know, what it is that we do see. And so we challenge our um, groups that are using these materials in lesson plans to measure dimensions of fossils and try to determine what the differences are uh, between some of these fossil areas. Some that we find here might look similar to the other area that we were in California. And overall, it's, the, it's similar in age. So between 2 million years ago, 5 million years ago, you know, very long time, Although in geological history, it's younger than um, the oldest forms of life on Earth, but still the same, you know, five million years old is nothing to uh, shake a stick at. But um, so back here at the beach, so those museum specimen photos that I was showing you um, and some of the close up of the fossils all come from these areas. And so when we approach the beach here, we look, you know, again, we see these gray rocks in the background. Um, you know, we see these kind of speckled bands and that's usually our first question is, oh, that's something different. You know, what could that be? So we keep looking and we're like, oh yeah, this is where we want you to look. It's like these bands and even that, those shell horizons are um, quite a bit different from the surrounding rock and chances are you know, those are the places where we're going to find some of the fossils that we're looking for. And unlike that first area that I showed you that was from the Central Valley, you know, these rocks have fossils, but they're a lot more broken up. So if you look at just all the white areas and all these kind of curvy, squiggly, um, rounded, um, you know, flat to arch shaped features, they're all parts of shells uh, like we see here, but they're really, really broken up. So in this area, these that we would ask different kinds of questions probably. It's like, you know, why are they so broken up? It's like, what's going on in this area that gives us a sense of understanding why sometimes we might find whole shells. And in this case, this is like a cutaway view of a snail 
And, you know, why in, this, in the same rock, you know, do we find broken pieces too? So it's just a combination of um, different kinds of, of evidence and observations that, that we would make. And uh, like the videos that I showed before, a lot of times we're trying to just understand, you know, how is it that we come to find these thin shells and rocks and sometimes they're even broken, but you know, how do these clams live anyway? And so even though they're super slow moving, so you got to watch for this, but you know, it's fun to really kind of um, dig in, if you will, into understanding how these clams live. So this is a modern clam, a living clam. See how it digs into the sediment like that? So it just with a muscle type feature digs in. And then these are called the siphons. It's like, it's part of the way it breathes um, when it's in the sediment. And, but it keeps digging in, digging in. And so see how its shell is lodged. Oh, and that's, see it's spitting out sediment and waste. But being buried like that in the sediment it leads us to understand why we see shells in um, these partially uh, buried conditions too. Now, the whole sediment area where uh, the rocks that we've been studying have lots of buried fossils, but sometimes we find them in these kind of life positions as we call them. And that's because, you know, they bury in rocks like that. So making that kind of connection where, you know, we're constantly asking, you know, what it is that we see um, that leads us to understand what the living animal looked like um, is part of this whole puzzle, you know, of putting it together. Um, and then we spend time in these uh, activities and uh, learning materials, uh, just giving people a chance to really explore, you know, how fossils are preserved and um, what, again, that tells us about ancient life. And this, this is a site I'll just go ahead and click on that I think you'll find enjoyable. So some of our partner museums have created this. It's called a digital atlas of ancient life. And so you can look at different kinds of fossil preservation. You know, you can explore fossils in general. Um, there's some really cool 3D images here. So this is an, an ancient cave bear. And so I'll just go ahead and load this 3D model. So what a lot of museums are trying to do now is scan in three dimensions. Um, all of the parts of these fossils, and in this case, it's a fossil skull. And then our users can uh, examine this in detail. You know, you can rotate it and see, and see, so you can see the front there, the side. So um, it lived about 20,000 years ago. And so it was an, an ancient bear so it lived in a lot of caves, but so you can turn it on its underside. You can see its teeth and then the back of the skull there. So this is a really great site that we um, like to use in education. And again, it's called the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. So here's a look at some of those snails. So if we are able to load the 3D model here, um, then again, we can turn the specimen around, you know, we can look in three dimensions, we can look at all the ridges. So these are really, really great tools um, that are helpful in just understanding all kinds of different animals. There's another snail there. And remember all of the different clams that we saw in the outcrops in the areas where I, we visited when we looked in the field. So now, you know, you can look at some yourself. Here's one with two valves together. You can see all the different features live. So we'll keep going. I think I only have a couple more minutes, but I'll show you some of these. So um, this is an ancient um, mammal from about um, 30 million years ago or so. Uh, so it's kind of an odd looking um, early mammal. Uh, so here, 
can see where its skull, where its eyes would have been. Again, there's its teeth from the side here. You can look underneath to see the writing there. This is from uh, one of the museums in South Dakota, and so they've analyzed it. So there's that. We'll just keep enjoying some of the different fossils here. This is a petrified wood. So we'll uh, have that model load. And you can look at some different features here too. So we'll click and hold and just rotate. So wood like um, animals gets buried as well. And so then it gets preserved. And uh, yeah, there's just, again, just different kinds of models here of how things um, are preserved. And so this is um, another ancient shell, but in this case, you can see how part of the shell is gone. You know, it's been preserved in this rock, but when we opened the rock, we saw the fossil shell there. And so we're still able to make interpretations and figure out what's going on. This look like some more plants here. This is a cool animal from way back um, 300 million years ago. Um, it's an ancient uh, kind of um, sea star. And so what you'll see when we load this um, is you get this kind of stalk uh, that, actually I might see if I can go full screen on this one. It's got some kind of int interesting features. Yeah, so here, what you're looking at are these different little segments. And again, it's preserved in the rock, but uh, what we are able to see um, are just some different parts. So I'll just scroll um, a little bit more mm -hmm. And we'll see what else is on this page. And there's some more snails. There's some different kinds of clams. And this one's kind of fun too, because what you're looking at is a single rock, but in the rock, there's like a dozen different parts of other shells and clams. And so, you know, we often have to look throughout the whole rock to see everything that's in there. And because, you know, we don't want to miss anything. And so that's just really fun to show uh, when we see that. Uh, and so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to go back to uh, Miss Takiwa and ask, uh, how am I doing on time? So I'm perfect on time. So. Okay. Do you have a few more things to show us, or are you? Uh, yeah, um, I'll just I'll show a few things more. Okay, yep, I'll show a few more things from that digital atlas of life, um, and then if uh, you or if uh, any questions came in. Um, okay. We'll we don't have them. any questions yet, so if we have okay. any questions later, we will um, email you a list of the questions to okay. answer. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just show a little bit more uh, from uh, that digital atlas where we were and you know, using uh, some of these in, in our different uh, lesson plans. And so you know, it's nice to be able to share in, in three dimension you know, everything that's here. And so I'll just show uh, just a few more of, again, just looking. So, in, you know, what we love, of course, about the three-dimensional websites and all of the great scans that are up is it's almost like, you know, holding it in your hand. And so that's super fun. It looks like it's in your hand because I was kind of like, oh, that's gross. Yeah, I know, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a... <laughs> but it's not living, so it's all dead. But um, let me go, okay, let's see. I think we've been on, let's click here. And so uh, Dr. White, these are things that, you know, especially now since we cannot really safely go anywhere, you know, are these yeah. things that if 
we can imagine we're at the beach looking at fossils if we want to and go to sites like these or imagine we're at a, a park. There you go. And so, you know, your whole theme of STEM in the city and why I was so excited to present is, you know, fr from your own home, whatever city you're in, you can just, you know, sort of peer into the life of a scientist and see what we see, you know, and be able to utilize all this information in ways that we do as well, because we share, you know, this, this same site mm -hmm. uh, are shared with other scientists because we also rely, you know, on these kinds of images. And so, so even not in a pandemic, this is the way that scientists share yeah. information and their, their findings with each other. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And so what we might do is we'll, uh, that video is moving fast, but I'll let it go while I talk over it. So we'll share the same, like we'll say, oh, will you send me an image, you know, of this clam? Or I don't have that in my collection. Um, can you share it, you know, with me? Because I'm trying to do some measurements. And it's so great. So now there's this whole a collection like this mm -hmm. and there are museums that have expanded their databases mm -hmm. so that they're able to share um, all of the different kinds of fossils that you know researchers would use and I just I have to click on this um, before we end because these are similar to the kinds of fossils I study so okay so for, uh, yeah my how do you say that word Okay, so yeah, it's called a foram, so foram manifera. We call it forams for short, but foram manifera. And a foram manifera, so that actually is the part of the organism because these little bumpy areas inside, there's a chamber or a foramen. So foram manifera are small animals. They're zooplankton or single-celled animals that have this kind of opening in, in the shell. And so they have some kind of crazy looking shells too. But we find these in ocean sediments. You know, we find them in sediments that we have on land. But this whole thing is about the size of a pinhead, this little shell, with this opening, that's it. That's the size it is. So we have to look at it, you know, under a microscope. But for something that's so small, um, it's a pretty amazing. Just the detail on their shell, you know, all these features and everything they have. And so all those bumps and ridges are clues to um, what this particular species is or um, even how it may have lived in some cases too. But yeah, but researchers, we use these websites too. Mm -hmm. Are there any, because um, these are fossils, so that means none of these animals or organisms are still alive, correct? Uh, so that's not correct, actually. Okay. Many of them, yep, yeah, many of them are alive. Um, so when we when we consider fossils, and I'll just uh, leave you with all this cool uh, phylum chordata, a chordate or animals with a, a spinal column or backbone. Yeah, so there are some fossils that have modern counterparts. So the, the actual fossil, you know, all the shells I was showing from those rocks in the field, uh, those have long been buried and uh, that... Um, you know, so all those animals aren't living anymore. But when we look in modern places around the world, we see their relatives. So uh, just because something's fossilized doesn't mean there isn't a similar animal that might live today. Now, some animals though, you know, we, we know most are extinct, like, you know, dinosaurs, most lineages are extinct, but I say most because modern birds are descended from dinosaurs and they're actually very close relatives, you know, even though 
they're um, smaller than you know most of the classic that we think large dinosaurs. Um, so as we understand the whole history of life, we know that you know some animals and plants have gone extinct. Some lineages have forms of life that um, have changed through time, you know, changed because of evolution and may look different. Uh, but oftentimes we are uh, after, you know, an understanding. Are the ones that you study, do they have modern? They do, like those small, tiny um, forams or foraminifera I was showing. Uh, yes, there are some extinct forms but there are plenty of forms that live in the ocean today. And so that's why they're so critical in helping us understand uh, modern and even future oceans and also climate change because we can use and you know, analyze and compare these ones that we see in the fossil record, which lived at times when temperatures were extreme but we just try to do all this kind of extrapolation, you know, understanding the connection to modern forms. Yep. So there now there are some animals that you know have gone completely extinct, and we just got a new grant at the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley to study some of these ancient, um, early like uh, 500 million years ago animals that don't have really um, good modern equivalents. And so we're gonna do some scanning of those images and you know more sharing of databases because one, one of the challenges of working in the museum with a collection, I think we've got 5 million different um, specimens in our collection is curating them properly. You know, it just means that we need to make sure they're cataloged, you know, properly identified that there are scanned records. And so there's parts of our collection where we need to do a better job of doing that. And so we'll be doing more of that, just better catalog, and especially with some of the ancient ones that, you know, we don't we don't find anymore. So that's fun. And yeah, here are just the That is so great. I assume that everything that was a fossil was gone. Like there's no traces of it. Yeah, there's, Yep, but they're equivalent. Yeah, so you know, by meaning of fossils are things that you know are ancient, old life, and that are you know preserved in a way. But there uh, can be some some modern equivalents. Yep, yeah, for sure. And so, and that's part of how we put you know a lot of things together. So okay. here, yes. Yeah, so there's fun stuff on this page. So I do hope people explore. Here's the big old megalodon tooth and. Yeah, so I have one awesome. question for you, Dr. White. Um, mm -hmm. last so you grew up in San Francisco in a city. How yeah. did you get interested in fossils and studying? Oh, and how do you think so paleontology existed? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness for museums, right? So, you know, I love to share that. So growing up in San Francisco, and, you know, I grew up in a time in the 70s where there was so much going on in the city. There was like a free concert every day. Or we go to the beach. My high school was near the beach in San Francisco. So every day after school, we're like, are we going to the beach? Are we going to go hear some music? But I also grew up near a museum, the California Academy of Sciences, where I'm now a fellow, uh, was right half a block from where I grew up in San Francisco. So with my sisters, I mean, we'd love to go there just to play, you know, sometimes we take classes. And even though I didn't really know I liked fossils, I was always really curious and I love museums anyway. I mean, it's just, there's so much interesting, so many interesting objects in museums. So I really, when I reflect now, even though I was so distracted by music and the arts and other things, and my first major in college was actually photography and not science. Uh, but I remembered, you know, my love of just museums, objects in museums. And so I think there's so much in, in a city that's STEM related that students can um, experience. So not only at museums, but, you know, just getting outside, you know, being able to observe nature. You know, I've been watching the black birders uh, posts on Twitter and everything. And 
they really encourage people, even in their own neighborhoods, you know, to make observations. And I know it's harder with fossils when you live in a city, you know, it's, it's certainly different from all those outcrop areas where I, I showed you, you know, where fossils are. Uh, but I think now, especially with all these online resources, um, you know, anyone can experience uh, the, you know, the joy and the fascination with fossils. But yeah, for me, it was just kind of a sense of curiosity. I did have an early experience with museums that was very memorable. But, you know, many years later in college, just taking a geology class for a general education requirement. And many paleontologists have initial training in geology. So my degree pathway, you know, was through geology. And then I later specialized, you know, in paleontology. But yeah, just sort of took a chance and, you know, really loved, um, <clears throat> excuse me, just, you know, the sense of adventure with um, understanding fossils and being able to do geological work. And um, you never know in life, right? Things you never know. Never, well, never, thank you never. so much, Dr. White. This was yeah. amazing. Um, just was, seeing all yeah, these yeah. resources and this link. And thank you so much. We recorded oh. this so people who weren't able to make it will be able to right. see all the great fossils that you right. showed us. So thank you so much and also for teaching us that yep. if you are in, interested in earth and environmental science yep. as well as like yep. computer science or art isn't yeah. don't you have to be familiar with earth and environmental science to upload this stuff and make sure you you're not messing mm -hmm. it up like i mispronounced a couple of things <laughs> <laughs> well and that's you know the whole value of working in teams so we have a great uh, team of people that I supervise at the museum that includes a graphic artist, a web manager, science writer. And then with the different grants that we've received at the Museum of Paleontology, we're partnered with PRI or the Paleontological Research Institution, and they're responsible for that digital atlas of life. So, and they've got people that, yeah, are, are more tech savvy than me. So we end up, you know, asking each other to handle certain tasks or um, graduate students are such a resource, undergraduate students too. So I get a, you know, a lot of help with what I do. And then I just love to showcase the websites of others. But yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, there are students and um, staff and technicians that are really experienced in scanning images, uploading the, atlas of life i was showing with all the 3d images there's this web uh, hosting site sketchfab and so you basically can send them the 3d images and and then it gets uploaded so there are a lot of different uh, supporting platforms for showing 3d images and that's really the way of museums now you know even before the pandemic kept us all from actually going to a museum uh, museums were busy digitizing and sharing resources in this way. So yeah, it's very 21st century. And, you know, when it comes to issues of equity and inclusion and accessibility, I'm very much liking what I'm seeing museum communities at least beginning to do is share these kinds of resources. But I think what we have to work harder on are the guides and, you know, the learning materials to support what it is everyone sees so that you can learn. And so that's what I hope to work on, continue to work on in the future, is just helping young people understand what they're seeing with the digital images and everything. So yeah, so stay tuned and happy to assist in a future STEM in the city and glad I could kick it off. Glad, and I, you know, now I'm hoping that when things open up, yep. maybe we can have a STEM in the city at a site. I somewhere know. People collect fossils and rocks. And, well, you said we can't collect rocks, right? Because they have to stay where they are. We can yeah. look at the rocks, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Pick them up and say what type of rock it is and put it back down, right? Put it back down. We can describe it together. Yeah. And we're talking about just again, when things open up, you know, maybe doing some live streams from the field and or even from our museum. And I know the graduate students are really eager 
to um, have a lot of just live events where even if we're not all together, but you know, we could at least be at some of the fossil sites sharing. So um, yeah, I think there can be some really exciting things to come. I'm excited. Well, thank you everyone for joining us or those who will listen to the recording. We hope that you come to future STEM in the cities or our future events and follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and at SEM link as well as Facebook. So thank you so much, Dr. White. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and be sure to check out these virtual field experience websites that Dr. White shared for you if you were with us, if you were interested in learning more about fossils and paleontology and anything else, and geology. geology. Yep, geology, paleontology, yep, field sites and um, and how we interpret um, the past history of life. Okay. All right. Thank Great. you so much. Okay. Bye. You're welcome. Everybody Bye. have a good, good weekend. Bye-bye.